Welcome to Eastlake. We are an inclusive faith community dedicated to the free search for truth and meaning, seeking to live out a more just and life-giving spirituality in the modern world. We see faith as less about doctrines and dogmas demanding total agreement, but a life to be lived, enjoyed, and given away to others. What unites us is a growing awareness that life is a gift and love is the point. We welcome the entire human family, regardless of race, age, creed, physical abilities, marital or economic status, gender identity, or sexual orientation. So if you are curious and have come to see, if you are tired and have come to rest, if you are grateful and have come to share, if you are journeying and have come to grow, if you are wounded and have come to heal, if you are joyful and have come to shine, welcome home. Today, we hear from Jason Lewis as he continues our series, Life to the Full. Please check the description for links to our quarterly Spotify playlist and guided meditation. Well, hey everyone, and welcome to Eastlake. My name is Jason, and I'm really glad to be with you for the final week of the series, Life to the Full. Now, hopefully you've been able to join us for the first two weeks. The first week, I kind of wanted to talk about just that idea, right? We hear Christ say, I came that they may have life and life to the full. And I know there's a variety of interpretations, but I think even that basic question of what is life to the full? What does that mean, right? And then we kind of wanted to basically create a space where we could have an open and honest look at who we are, where we find value, and what we're naturally engaging in in our life, where our energy goes up, our sense of excitement, our sense of meaning and purpose and connection really starts to flourish. And so it's, it's hard to be prescriptive around those things because each of us is so very different from the other. But I tried to offer just a variety of, of kind of ways that people move through the world. And hopefully you found yourself represented there and if not, at least hopefully what you were aware of is that that exercise of thinking about who I am, the kinds of things I connect with, what really matters to me, how I'm, I'm seeing, perceiving, and moving through the world really does give us an idea of where we may need to grow, where we, what we may need to learn, where we kind of maybe need to let go of something or forgive or heal, um, where we may need to even try or explore because maybe more life is on the other side of that. Maybe we have like a hidden passion or desire that we've we've never done or a place we really wanted to travel or a relationship that we wanted to fix. And so wanting to create this space where everyone could kind of throw themselves into the mix and begin examining who they are, where they're at, and what life to the full really looks like and may look like for them. The second week, I had a lovely conversation with my sister Callie, who's just staggeringly brilliant. But um, <laughs> the main reason was is because for most of us, I think we experience life to the full uh, in one major facet, which is our relationships. And that's a pretty big one, right? Whether it's family or friends, children or partners, the reality is the way we connect inside of our relationships and what we draw from them, how we show up in them and how those relationships give back to us matters a great deal in terms of how we are experiencing the fullness, the meaning, and the value of our life. And my sister kind of offered what I thought were some really just like super straightforward and, and lovely things. I learned a lot, and it was also just also more than anything, a really good reminder um, about like, hey, inside relationships, you gotta manage your boundaries, right? Because when it's just you, and you're just thinking about you, and you're crafting and building your life in such a way that the fullness comes as you kind of self-determine it, once you bring another person into the mix, all of a sudden now you have another person's emotions, another person's issues, traumas, fears, concerns, excitements, passions, whatever it is, right? And now you have this whole separate energy that is impacting you, that you might even in fact be obligated to have duties and roles and responsibilities and quickly we can lose ourselves. We can lose our concept of what life to the full means. And if we lose it, 
then the issue becomes that it's very, very challenging to manage a relationship and show up in an authentic way. And my personal take is, um, like I said, kind of like with Callie um, in, in the second week, to that own self be true, right? We have to have a measure of, of this is real for me, this is authentic for me, and the way we show up in relationships and manage those boundaries really matters. She talked about, you know, a little bit about how um, wanting relationships to be reciprocal, that we treat others the way we like to be treated, right? That kind of golden rule or the notion that as we do so in relationships and we we work toward, we support and we encourage the fullness and flourishing of the people in our life. And as that comes back to us, right, we kind of naturally kind of ebb and flow in this way where we bolster one another, encourage one another and create an environment that engenders an authentic life. And that very deep sense of fullness, because what you know now is I can engage in this relationship. I can connect with this person or these people or these family members or, or my child and simultaneously remain myself. And, and, and I think for some of us, me specifically, it's kind of hard. A lot of us are, are people pleasers or whatever. So I think it's that work that then enables us again to carry our life to the full forward into our relationships. In today's final week, it's not a super long talk. But I, I kind of, when I looked out, I'm like just examining the people that I love, that I admire, um, and their lives. And are there any other pieces that I see? Because I think it's important to pay attention to self and pay attention to relational dynamics. Those are really kind of the big two. But what I kind of realized was, is like these things are kind of constant operative modes. Like I'm moving through my life like this. These are the things I value. Boom. Like it's just kind of like, you know, a stake in the ground. And then in relationships, it's like, this person is in my life. These people are in my life. It's kind of a constant, right? And so that's why that is so important to figure out, to understand for ourselves, to begin that process and, and pay attention and, and kind of perennially engage in, in re-examining and participating and asking questions about those, those two dynamics. But there are also these rhythmic traits that I notice happen inside the lives of People that look very fulfilled, uh, people that I know to be fulfilled and very happy, and also people that I, I really see as human beings who experience their life as being tremendously full. And so we're going to talk about three of those things today. And these are kind of the three primary ones. I wouldn't say that's all that's there. So again, right, like these are not prescriptive. Each of us as an individual, we have our own things that we uniquely connect with, find true and valuable for us. So I'm not saying this is an exhaustive list, <laughs> but but this definitely is three things that I see is quite common. They, they tend to be almost a universal uh, reality. Um, and the first one I noticed for sure um, was the practice and rhythmic practice of gratitude, right? I think we hear this word a lot, um, and I think it maybe sometimes comes off like a little bit cliche, this idea of like count your blessings. But the truth is, right, like the hard science on it is that when we count our blessings, it actually fundamentally alters our neurology, right, and our biochemistry inside of our brain. It throws us into parasympathetic nervous system, turns off cortisol, helps us to turn on the high centers of thinking, improves working memory and long-term memory storage, enables us to respond better, to respond wiser, to even engage in conflict and complex scenarios so much better and clearer-minded. Um, and I know for me, especially right now in the world, <laughs> there's a lot of heavy things. And so reminding myself every day to find a moment of being grateful and to actually meaningfully count my blessings, right? Like I, if I really slow down and I go, I'm really, really lucky to have my boy. I'm really tremendously lucky to have a career and a job that enables me to provide. All of my family is healthy and doing well. And we're all so very close. Um, I'll get choked up talking about it. The reality is, is as I begin that process of thinking about the good in my life, the meaningful and the value in my life, I very quickly feel that my life is quite full and uh, very much a privilege. And this isn't a complex thing. It's not a secret. Right. It's not supposed to be like cool or hip or like I have some groundbreaking news. It's just a reminder that this practice is done by so many people in so many cultures. And the primary reason is, is you have to look up and smell the roses to remember that you're in a rose garden 
right? Like, I don't know if you've ever been on a hike, but I've done this before. Where like, you get on the hike and someone's like, yeah, it's about five miles. And you're like, God, five miles. I better just bust it. I better just bust my ass and get to the top of that thing. And I've done that hike before. And when I have, I missed everything along the way. Everything was about the destination. It was about this end goal. It was about, you know, just achieving this thing. And I think we we see this so much just in American culture. It moves so dang fast. And it certainly places a tremendous value on grind culture. This idea that you just need to get in there and slug away till you win. Instead of going like, hey, you can do that. And striving is good. There's nothing inherently bad about it. But we also have to understand that, like, we kind of aren't a robot. We weren't meant to just push endlessly. And I think sometimes we look out at people and we're like, well, that's what they do. And look how happy and successful they are. I'm like, well, it's also possible that that thing is so deeply moving to them. And actually, that is the thing they're so deeply grateful for. And that it provides them such a sense of joy that what looks like grinding to you for them is play. And I think for, for myself, you know, I've been on other hikes where I just go, you know what? We're just going to cruise. We're going to cruise and do a little bit and then look up and take in what's around us. We're going to go for a little bit and we're going to pause and we're going to go, oh yeah, I did just do that. Oh yeah, that was so lovely. Or, oh my gosh, look at that, right? And that experience actually completely changes the dynamic of the very same activity. And now that hike is a hugely deep memory. Like there's hikes I've done, I can't even remember because I wasn't in a state of gratitude. I wasn't in a state of observation. It was go, 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 go. I was in war mode, right? <laughs> you don't you don't really perceive when you're in war mode. It's just too it's too operative. It's too it's too intense. And there's a time for that, for sure. But it's just understanding that a rhythmic practice of slowing down and being grateful really helps us to just connect to our life, to feel inside it, and to remember it, all the beauty that's around us. And even in the hardest things, the hardest moments I've been through. If I'm talking about what I think may have been the very first thing that helped lift me from that, it probably was the meditation on all the good that still remained. And I know that life can be tremendously unfair and painful, but I do think that it is that process where we go, yeah, that was real and that is true. And also still, there is so much good here. There is so much love and so much life and so much beauty left to perceive, participate and witness. It is that recognition that I think has propelled me out of those doldrums into a space of really a sense of a full life. Hey East Lake, Peter here. Thanks so much for tuning in to watch this message. I wanted to do just a quick interruption to say thank you to so many of you who are making regular contributions to East Lake. East Lake is a nonprofit and everything that we do is because of a community of consistent and generous people who really believe in this place and want to see it continue. So uh, if you're a part of that community, thank you for how you make this place go. If you are tuning in regularly and are part of this community, but you haven't yet um, jumped in to making a financial contribution, we would encourage you to do that and encourage you to go to eastlakecc.com to help support Eastlake as a community and continue to make these messages possible. Thanks so much for uh, letting me interrupt your message. Let's jump back in. I think a second thing that I really see a lot is self-care. Now, I know this is kind of like a big business deal right now. So I know like everybody and their brothers like hashtag self-care Sunday. And it's, <laughs> it's really become like this titanic industry. And I think it can come across sometimes as a little bit like ridiculous or indulgent. But in truth, I think the fundamental acknowledgement that we matter, that that we have a value and that to care for that value and to honor that value once a week, right? You put that over, you know, a whole year, that's 52 weeks, right? You're going 52 days of the year. I'm just taking a day to do some of the things that really matter to me that I love, that make me excited about my life, right? Life can't always be about problems. It can't always be about achieving goals. It can't always be about striving. Some of it has to be about taking care of ourselves and our own needs, I think if we want to be people that represent that life is a gift and love is the point, we probably ought to be people who also like this life that we've said is a gift, <laughs> right? And that we actually are able to show up in love with a sense of joy, which means we need a measure of self-love. We need a measure of self-acceptance. We need a measure of self-forgiveness. We need a measure of self-pleasure to be able to 
go and do the things that really make our life full. And it's so funny because I think I look out at people and I, I just so love them, but I can see them in so many ways do things that I know they may enjoy them, but, or I mean, I know they may think they're important, but they don't necessarily enjoy them. And then that important thing, that quote unquote, the right thing becomes everything. And then they look up down the road and they're like, man, I'm, I'm actually really unhappy. And it's because we are a creature of give and take, of ebb and flow, right? And these kinds of comings and goings. And, and the reason this is so important is because what we need in each season of our life is so very different, right? Like when I first had Huck and he was a little baby, like the self-care looked like I need to sleep, dog. Like <laughs> I just need to sleep. And as I've gotten older, self-care looks like I want to create in my life margin to connect with the people I love. I'm not going to let work become the sole focus of my life. And doing that, being intentional in it, has dramatically improved my relationships and more than anything, giving me a sense that I'm really connected to myself. I wanna be able to show up for people in very real and valid ways. I wanna be able to honor, respect, engage, and also deeply support people. If I can't recognize my own value, it's really hard to show up consistently because then I feel like I'm giving from something I don't have I get real tired really quick. And, and this may just be me, but I also notice too, that in some ways, I don't actually have the sense that what I'm doing and participating is exciting, is lovely, is good. Whereas if I have my self-love, if I've been, as I said earlier in week one, right, to that own self be true, if I've been true to myself and I've gone, you know what? I needed to lift weights today. I needed to read this book I've been dying to read. I had to watch this movie. I like, you know, now none of those things are like critical. And that's the point. That's why I think sometimes they get made fun of. But the truth is that it's the gas I burn when all of a sudden I'm in something where someone's lost a parent or when someone needs me to watch the kids because they have something they have to go do and last minute I have to change all my plans. I'm not as thrown off and I'm not, it's not as challenging for me because I'm like, ah, but see, I took care of myself. I'm good. I did what I needed to do for me. So it's much easier now to do for you what I need to do. And so I don't think it's trivial and I don't think it's silly. And I think when we look out at the world, this is why things like girl trips matter and going to play golf with your buddies and going to a movie or, you know, hanging out with family or doing a fire pit. It's all so valuable and it's all so vital because it's a little bit of the lifeblood that enables us to do all the other things we want. I think even when we like look at our kids, right? Like my son, he's six, he's almost seven. And the facts are, is like, yeah, he needs to go to school and yeah, he's got chores to do. And yeah, he needs to grow and learn and challenge himself in all these ways. But also like homie needs to eat a s'more around a fire pit. You know, he needs to watch a Jurassic Park movie. He needs to have a wrestling match with dad, right? He needs to eat a popsicle on a sunny day. He just needs to do some things that are just good, that just feel good. And I think the reason it makes me emotional is because I think sometimes it gets dispensed with that part of life is to recognize that it's beautiful and good and it has all these lovely things. And if you don't participate in them, how are you ever going to see life that way? How are you going to perceive that your existence is a gift, right? Like we're saying that life is a gift. Well, gifts, I, I, I like getting gifts. I've always been a fan of Christmas. <laughs> like It's fun to get a gift. So I would argue then that in our life, there has to be a measure where we are capable of giving ourselves gifts. We're capable of honoring what we need and respecting it because then we're able to better respect other people's needs and, and what they need. And even if it's different from us, we're okay because we've done our job of taking care of ourselves. And so I notice even amongst and even with my kid that when he has that space and I go, hey man, now we got to do yard work for an hour. Hey man, now we got to like sit down and study some letters and numbers. Wow, is he so much more able to do it because he's like, well, I had some fun. I did some good things. I did some things I really liked. And now there's just some things I have to do. If we don't manage that balance, I think it's very hard to experience our life as full. A full life definitely has fun in it. Definitely has some true excitement about what it gets to participate in and be a part of. And the last thing is service. I think this can be a little bit of a tricky one because this on the other side of the coin from self-care kind of gets like put up on a pedestal as like, if you serve, then your life is full. And, and that the ratio is one to one. The more you serve, the more you get back. And I would say that it's 
it's not necessarily that way. I think it's a very unique person who can make their life all about service. It really is. And I think those people are to be revered for sure. But I also don't think that other people who approach it in rhythmic, consistent ways are any less valuable. And in fact, I think it's that which is most sustainable for more of us. I, While I love Mother Teresa, I recognize that that life of dropping decades in the most dire, deep suffering and service, it costs her something because that ability to self-care and to be able to acknowledge the value of that wasn't really a part of that that culture and the world at that time as vital. And what we know now in psychology and sociology is that it is vital, that self-care and service actually provide this deep meaning and value. I'm sure we've all had moments where we really take care of someone, where we really look out for someone, and we feel such a tremendous sense of value and pride, and also a weird sense of like humbleness and gratitude even. Like I, I have worked with at-risk youth, incarcerated youth, homeless mothers and children, I've done a million different things. And also in my job every day um, as a firefighter, I serve people that are in emergencies, big bad ones. And the thing is, it is in that service that I walk out and go, I I'm really deeply glad to have been, I don't always like what happens and what is happening, but I am glad to have been a part of a solution. I am grateful and humbled to have been a part of healing of fixing, of solving, um, of showing up on behalf of another person and communicating that you matter. And I think that at Eastlake has been a long running part of who we are. And that has meant a great deal to me. I think that the way we engage in the modern era in service, especially right now when the world feels pretty rough and, <laughs> and chaotic and scary, and uncertain and at times divided. I think it's how we show up and serve one another in these times and even people that may be on the opposite side from us. I think these things greatly matter and I also think they give our life a sense of fullness because I think we could all acknowledge that at least I would see it this way. I'll say that. I would see it this way that caring for our fellow mankind is the highest game but it's also a very expensive game, a very costly game and we have to be the kind of people who can hold, as I talked about, the gratitude, the self-care and balance, but it is that we have to play this game. I think a life that spends a, a bulk of its time in the deeply indulgent way of constantly concerning oneself with oneself is just as possibly a pitfall for a full life as it is to only think of others. I think then we forget us and we forget what we need. So. I hope that idea of service really makes sense. I think when we think of our humanity's brightest and best, right? <laughs> Across cultures and races and genders, whatever, but people who shift the world, who alter culture, who inspire us. When I see people serve from a place of love, from a place of excitement, from a place of health and strength, I'm always like, God, I wanna be like that person. Look how much they can do. Look how high capacity they are. But then I recognize that the best at it, the people who are the best at it, they also are just as much interested and care just as much about the gratitude of their life and also the way that they take care of themselves. So I think when we look at service, we have to try to find ways that we can regularly engage and connect to people, our family, our friends. And it can look as simple as like calling and saying, hey, just checking in. How are you? Is there anything you need? Or calling someone you know that's gone through a loss and being, and being like, hey, I'm outside. I brought some food. I just want you to know I am around. I love you. I see you. You know, and should you ever need anything, I'm just telling you I'm here, right? Like, let's not make them do the work. Let's just show up for them, right? Maybe it's checking in with your kid. I do this all the time where I'm like, hey, hey, bud, like, how's things going? How's this last month, right? Dad's always trying his best, but I want to hear from you, right? My job and my role is to serve and guide you. And if I'm not doing that right, like, I want to know. And I want to be able to show up because I know that for me, caring about you showing up for you, that means such a great deal to me. I draw so much value from the way I serve you because I made you and you get what I give you. So it's very, very critical that I'm doing that to the best of my ability or reaching out to family, asking to repair things, showing up for someone that you know simply just needs a hand or just being there to listen to someone who just needs an ear. The way we serve people is in so many ways and it doesn't have to be these big, 
you know, romantic acts, even though I think those are beautiful and they definitely count, but there are so many ways that we can rhythmically, regularly participate in serving that I think gives us the opportunity to really connect to other people and to other lives and to other ways of being in the world that broadens our view and reminds us of the complexity, the nuance and the challenge of life, but also the kind of mystery and miraculous nature of how when I do something for another person, it's like I sometimes did something for myself. So weird how that works. And for some reason we're crafted that way. And so to ignore it, to pretend that showing up and doing things, and I would say this too, inconveniencing yourself really does create in you a sense of pride and a sense of honor and um, a real sense that every life around you matters. And I think if you've ever heard me talk, you know that I'm a just a sold out person for the idea of, of corporate mutuality, that we're all irrevocably tied to each other and that I'm not good till you're good and you aren't good till I'm good. And we're on this journey together to make sure that we're all good. And so I hope that you can see the value of service, find some ways in your life to participate, extend yourself, but do it in a way that's sustainable. Do it in a way that you actually can truly show up and that's authentic and real. And when you do it, I think you'll find that there's so much there that will be added to your life and give you such a tremendous sense of fullness and wholeness. So in closing, I, I want to say as we've, you know, finally made it, I, you can see behind me, like I'm literally looking at it and I can't wait to go outside. <laughs> but the idea is like, we're in summer, right? I talked about this the first week. We're here. It's here now. And it is the season where everything is the most beautiful. I mean, I almost didn't make it through the gray this spring. And now when I look out, I'm reminded like, that's why I live here. Because everything is so stunning. It just flourishes in such a way that is just remarkable to me. And it makes me so badly want to live that life. And it really makes me want it for everyone I know and even people I don't. I, I really deeply want people to have that sense that their life is full. And I so hope that this series has been a place where you've been able to ask questions, explore, try things, um, be curious, and hopefully look at your life in this intentional and critical, not critical like that, but you know what I mean, in a way of assessing your life where you're able to figure out what you need, where you can show up, how you need to hold boundaries, how you need to honor yourself, how you can serve, what you can be grateful for, right? What are your interests and passions? And go, man, let's make this life. Let, let's be intentional about it. Let's recognize we got one wild and precious one. And the way we show up and it matters because if we do that, then we don't experience life as something that's just chaotic and happening to us. We experience ourselves as an agent building a story going on a journey to flourish and very much in the season when everything is blossoming and blooming and soaking up the sun and the, that gorgeous blue sky like let us be those people who do that with our life let's make of our life a rose this idea that when we take in the right nutrients when we give ourselves the adequate light when we honor what our needs are and feed ourselves in a way that's useful and considerate and careful and, and wise, then we have such a tremendous chance to bloom, such a chance to flourish. And I think the world sometimes forgets this. And I think in hard seasons, it's, it's challenging to remember that that's always been the game. And so I hope that this message was useful. I hope that you can find a way to engage with this material in rhythmic ways and consistent ways and, and practice gratitude and take care of your important self. You are somebody and you so deeply matter. And so honoring yourself and giving yourself those things, those things matter, they really do. Even if it's something as simple as sitting on a couch and watching a football game. The truth is, is the things you love in life, please participate them in them and then serve that others matter too. And that our ability to show up on their behalf says a great deal about us. And especially here at East, like this community that I so deeply love. I think we should be marked by this, by both things. I think if we can do that, boy, do we get the chance to shake the world up and remind people of this nice ebb and flow, this seasonal way of living. So again, thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. Thank you for journeying with me these past three weeks. I hope I've said something that was helpful and useful and encouraging to you. 
And I hope it's something that you can take, at least some things you can take into your life to make sure that with the one life you have, that it is tremendously full. Have a great summer. I hope to see you soon. Take care. Peace. Thank you for joining us. To make a donation, head to eastlakecc.com slash donate.